this one continuity at a point. So the graph that we're the same as we used last time. we see that there are a lot of discontinuities there. Where are our points of, of discontinuity? One, two, and four. Why are they discontinuous there? Yeah, they have jumps, they have breaks. At one and two, those are called jump discontinuities. And four, yes. Because the values are jumps. Now, why are they discontinuous at those points? Using math. Not because the picture says it that way. How do we prove that they're discontinuous at those points? And what do we call that? A, 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 well, yes. But with what we were talking about today, what do we just talk about? One side of limits. Because at one, the limit as X approaches one from the left the limit as X approaches one from the right. As it approaches one from the left, what is it? Zero, because it's going down to zero. As it comes from the right, that's why it's a discontinuity. Because in order to be continuous from both directions, they have to go to the same point. But yeah, actually, it's, it's a three-part. It's actually a four-part definition. Same thing at two. Well, is two a discontinuity? Yes, by the graph, but not by the limit theorem. By limits, as we go to two from both, it equals one, that. So the limit as x approaches two from the left, the answer is one. This also equals the limit as X approaches two from the right. It also equals one. Three is a straight up easy one because it is continuous there. But four, as we approach four, it's approaching one, but at four, it's one half. So four is another one we have to look at. The limit as X approaches four from the left, it approaches one, but F of four is equal to one half. So these actually give us the definition of continuity. Because here we have all the conditions we need. If you still need it up there. Let's define continuity. Let me 
continuous function. A function f of x is continuous on some interval, can be open or closed, or any partial thereof. If these conditions exist, we have our limit. First off, the limit as x approaches c exists. So what does that mean? That means two parts. The limit as x approaches c from the left and the limit as x approaches c from the right. They have to exist and they have to be the same value. Yeah, because a two-sided limit is defined by two one-sided limits and they all have to be true. Um, it's, it's part of function, right? If not, that's why it skips. Or well, that's where we have an asymptote. It's, it, it's, and we'll look at some of those examples today. So that's the first one. F of C has to exist. And the limit as X approaches C and they have to be the same. So the limits have to exist. The point has to exist and they have to be the same point. Example. Here's an example. Ah, example two. Is that a continuous function? Again, we know, but we have to prove it mathematically. Remember what it says. Okay, because for any C, in the, in the interior points, does the limit exist as X approaches C inside that function. Yeah, because what does the graph look like? So any of these interior points, it matches to a, a point and the limit exists on both sides. So the only place that we have to worry about are the endpoints. as x approaches negative two. Does that exist? Remember, for the, for the limit to exist, it has to have both sides. At negative two, does it have a right-sided limit? Does it have a left-sided? Does it need a left-sided? No, because it's not in the domain. The domain simply says from negative two to two. All the points are defined at those values. So the limit of this one is zero. And the other side, the limit as x approaches positive two of our function also equals zero. And it also exists. The right-hand side doesn't have to exist because it's not in the domain. The left side exists because every point is divine. So that is a continuous function.
How about a piecewise defined function? Or like the, not a piecewise, but a, a greatest integer function. This is example four. Is it continuous? Where, where, if anywhere, is it continuous? It's continuous on all non-integer numbers. Remember the graph, what it looks like. Where do all the jumps occur? At all integers. Between there, yeah, all the points, the interior points exist. The only place where it's discontinuous are at the integers. Integer is a number. One, two, three, four, no decimals. Yes, I should have, I should have, yes. An integer are the positive and negative numbers that we label here, and zero. So for example, at two, limit as x approaches two from the left, as opposed to limit as x approaches two from the right. As x approaches two from the left, the value is one. But as it approaches two from the right, the answer is two. The problem only occurs at that value. Since they're going different directions, the, the it's a jump discontinuity, so it is a discontinuous, but it's discontinuous only at the inter integers. Can we make a function continuous? It, I mean, the safe answer is yeah, why not? Sure, but how? No. Well, let's do sine x over x. Because remember, to be continuous, what's the only point in contention that'll give us a problem here? What's the only x value that's going to give us a problem? So if we looked at the limit as x approaches zero, remember, to be continuous, what has to exist? Let's look at the graph. To be continuous, three things have to exist. We have to be able to go from, from the left side. From the right side. And then we also have to be able to do it at that value. Remember, it has to have a left, left side limit, right side limit, and they both have to point to the same place. That same place has to be that value. So at zero, it doesn't exist because sine of zero over zero is undefined. That's why there's a hole there. It's not continuous. So is there a way we can make it continuous? To 
think of this. Sine x over x for all x's not equal to zero and one for all x's equal zero. Would this fill in that hole? Now we have a continuous function. Whereas this is where the beauty of mathematics, you can make it do what you want it to do. So if you're asked to, just make sure you look at the graph and then make a uh, piecewise defined function from there. Infinite discontinuity. What do you think that means? No. An asymptote, exactly. Because a, a parabola, the limit exists everywhere. There's a, any, any x you give me, I can have a y value. But the problem, let's say we had this function. So basically, this tells us we can, our domain is everything except zero. So when x is negative, y is going to be positive. And when y, x is positive, y is positive. So here we have, it's going to positive infinity. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the right goes to positive infinity. The limit as x approaches zero from the left also goes to positive infinity. But we can't fix this one. Even when we did a piecewise defined function, what would it be? You can never make these two lines meet. You can't say at zero it's zero or zero it's one because it's going to infinity, they'll never meet. They're asymptotic. So there's no way you can fix this one. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a trick question. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's my example. The function is this. Continue us on its domain. Is it continuous on its domain? I see some people nodding yes, some people nodding no, some people sleeping. Is it continuous? What does the graph look like? Nah, don't put your cake, put your cake down. So, is it continuous? Optimal word, domain. What is the domain of this function? Any integer except zero. So since I can't use zero, I can't think about it. So is it continuous on everything bigger than zero? Is it continuous on anything less than zero? So yes, the answer is yes. Because it's continuous on its domain. Its domain is from negative infinity 
to zero, and then from zero to positive infinity. Now this, this kind of seems like you get into nit, the, the nitpicky stuff, but the definitions are very important. What does continuity mean? It's continuous on its domain. If you def if I if I define the domain as negative two to two, then the answer is no, because zero is inside that domain. But since I simply had that, the domain is anything except zero. So get properties. Properties of continuous functions. F and G are continuous functions. At X, even at C, the follow exist. You've seen these before. There are seven of them. The sum of two continuous functions. Since f of x and g of x are both continuous functions, then the sum of those two functions is continuous. The difference between the two functions. If the two functions are continuous, then the difference of the two functions are continuous. The constant multiple If f of x is continuous, simply multiplying by a number isn't going to change it. It's still going to be continuous. It's just going to be higher up on the graph or lower, depending on positive or negative. The product of two functions, f of x times g of x, if they're both continuous, the product will be continuous, as will their quotient. f of x over g of x, as long as g of x is not zero. The power rule, f of x to the power, is the same as the multiple rule, uh, the, the product rule. If f of x is continuous, no matter how many times you multiply it to itself, it's still going to be continuous. The radical rule, the root rule. nth root of any continuous function is still going to be continuous. It's just that it can't be defined in negatives. f of x must be bigger than or equal to zero. Imaginary numbers. imaginary numbers also, but imaginary numbers have to happen in conjugate pairs. So even if you have polynomials, the limits of those as x approaches c, those exist. Uh, 
and the quotient rule. As long as they're both continuous functions and the bottom is not equal to zero, it'll work. Now we go. So what does this tell us? If two functions are continuous, it's going to stay continuous. What about the inverses? Remember what we learned in algebra. If a, if a function has an inverse, is it still a function? It has to be one-to-one. -one. So it has to be. Basically, all in, what does an inverse really do? It flips it about that axis. Exponential function, it becomes a logarithmic function. So if you have a parabola, we have the, the radical. It's not going to be hyperboloid. It simply falls over, and it's only the positive side of it. Those are all inverses. Same with cube root functions or cubic functions. That's x cubed. The cube root looks like this. So if it's continuous, that means it's one to one. That means the inverse has to be continuous and one to one. Yeah, well, yes, it was log base e is ln. So yeah, so that's what those are. Bless you. How about composite functions? What are composite functions? Remember the fog and goth from algebra? They're functions within functions. If g of x is continuous, then f of g of x is going to be continuous. So words, let's say the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to b. So at g of c, we get b. So this becomes f of b. It's still a function with respect to x. And remember, f and g are both continuous functions. So it's still continuous. So composite functions are always continuous on its domain. You should have this on your sheet. Show the following functions are continuous on their natural domains. What's the domain of this one? Negative, negative five? What's the only thing we cannot have in a radical? Is a negative. It could be zero. It could be positive. So what we would have to do is find out where this parabola is negative. So let's say we graph it, and it looks like this. This is A, and this is B. Our domain of this one is we cannot use anything between A and B because the values of this function are negative. We can only use where the graph is touching the x-axis 
or above the x-axis. That's the natural domain of this, of the radical. It's what? Well, it could be continuous. It's just on its domain. Because remember, the domain of the radical is from zero to infinity. Or whatever. That's with this one. If we have an equation in there, the domain. So if we have x minus 2, what's the domain of that one? It shifts to the right two spaces. So with this one, we would have to find out where it's zero. How would you do that? We have to find where the x-intercepts. How do you do that? We can use quadratic formula. Or we can use complete the square. We can't use factoring. What times what is five when you subtract and we get two? Can't do it. So it's going to be some kind of fraction or imaginary numbers. So uh, if we if we did that, we'd get negative b plus or minus square root of b squared. And find out where the zeros are. If the zeros exist, then we have, we have a part where we can't use, where it's negative. How can we tell if it's going to have any negative answers? The discriminant. If it's zero, it only touches the x-axis once. If it's positive, it goes in there twice. If it's negative, it's an imaginary answer. So it never crosses the x-axis. So what do we have here? We have negative two squared minus four times one times negative five. Four plus 20 is 24. So we are going to have x-intercepts. And all this stuff, see, all the stuff you think you never use again in algebra, you use again. So basically, it, it is continuous on its natural domain because the natural domain says whatever's inside the radical has to be zero or positive. How about B? Best. B is y equals x to the two thirds, one plus x to the fourth. Same thing with C, actually. x minus two, x squared minus two. x sine x, x squared plus 2. So, what about b? Where is it continuous on its natural domain? So, look, I'm sorry, you didn't tell Are there any asymptotes there? Remember, the only asymptotes we have with rational functions, can the bottom ever be zero? No, because this is always going to be positive. So this one is continuous everywhere, all real numbers. How about the last, uh, the, the C?
C is continuous. Again, we look at the bottom number. The only one we can't have is a negative there. I mean, it's a zero. What would make it equal zero? So as long as X does not equal plus or minus radical two, it's okay. And how about D? Can the bottom ever be zero? Nope. And so if X is zero, we get zero on top over two. That's okay. There's no way, so this is continuous everywhere. So again, the rules of algebra still apply here. If you have a rational, look at the bottom number. If you have a radical, think of the rules of the radical. Example nine, apply theorem 10. That's what pretty much what I told you. If we have f of g of x and the limit of g of x as x approaches c is equal to b, then we have f, the limit as x approaches c again of this one. So let's look what this means. The limit basically means work on the inside out. The limit as x approaches pi over 2 of cosine 2x plus sine 3 pi over 2 plus x. Let's work that one out. Plug the inside. What do we got on the inside? If we plug in pi over 2, we get cosine 2 times pi over 2 plus sine 3 pi over 2 plus pi over 2. Two cancel, so we have pi. Three pi over two plus one pi over two is four pi over two. Four pi over two is two pi, so we have sine of two pi. What is sine of 2 pi? Zero. So think of it this way. What's the, lo what's the point location of that one on a unit circle? One comma zero. And every point is made up of a cosine sine. So the cosine is the x value, sine is the y value. At 2 pi, sine is 0. At pi over 2, sine is 1. So the sines are the y values, cosines are the x values. So now we have that zero. So we have cosine of pi. So this is zero. This is pi over two. This is pi, three pi over two, two pi. So cosine of pi is what? Negative one.
so much again. This will be the last one we do today. Yeah, we'll finish up last next time, but we'll, we'll finish up this example. B says the limit of, no, as X approaches one of the inverse of sine of one minus X, one minus X squared. So again, if we put one inside there, what do we get? Zero over zero. Can we do anything inside there? The denominator is a perfect square, which makes it one plus x, one minus x. So the one minus X is cancel. And we have one over one plus X. We could plug in our X, which is one. So the inverse of sine of one half. Notice what this is asking. What angle of sine gives me one half? Which one? Pi uh, over six. Okay, again. The algebra is just jumping in our face everywhere. And so this this inverse of sine of one half at basically is saying is sine pi over six is one half. That's what it's saying. And the last one is the radical e tangent one. C. The limit as x approaches zero of the radical of x plus one e tangent x. This is multiplied. Remember the product rule. The product rule says if I'm taking the limit of f times g, I can take the limit of f times the limit of g. So as x approaches zero of this one times the limit of e tangent x as x approaches zero, but since oops, tangent x, since the the limit is up there. It's E, the limit of tangent X as X approaches zero. I'm thinking the limit of the, the function of E. So plug them in there. What is this one going to give us? Can we put zero in there? Zero plus one times E tangent of zero. Tangent is sine zero over cosine zero. So it's zero over one. So it's E over zero. Square root of one is one. 
anything to the zero power is one. So the answer is one. And the last part deals with the um, intermediate value theorem. Do y'all remember what that says? The intermediate value theorem from algebra? It says this, if I have a function given any function f of x, and I have two points, a and b, if these two points have different signs, if this one's positive and this one's negative, then what does that assure me? Not, not me. Then somewhere between there, f of x has to equal zero. Has to, it has to cross the x-axis somewhere at least once. That's the intermediate value theorem. So will there be a solution, an x-intercept, if I have these two values? It won't tell you where they are. It tells you if they, if they exist. So, all right, everybody. Have a great, safe day doing math.